Uh, thanks for joining. We have a full house, so let's get started. Today we're going to talk about hallucination-free LLMs, mostly how to monitor them and how to mitigate hallucinations after we've managed to detect them. Uh, first, a bit of background about me. Uh, so, NaniML is a company I co-founded, and what we do is classical machine learning monitoring, so monitoring everything that has to do with uh, basically predictive AI or predictive ML when we try to predict something in the future. Uh, but we are also building a tool to monitor LLMs and especially detect and mitigate hallucinations for LLMs that are actually in production and are making some kind of business decisions. Uh, so to do that, uh, we read and evaluated hundreds of papers uh, and the results of the evaluation will be at the end. But before that, let's go over the agenda. So first we're gonna start with what is LLM monitoring and what are the parts of LLM monitoring and where hallucination detection lies. Uh, then we're gonna talk about four different ways or approaches or groups of algorithms that have been developed to detect hallucinations. First is gonna revolve around detecting or measuring the consistency of an answer of an LLM. Second one is gonna focus on directly using another or maybe the same LLM to evaluate the quality of the answer. Uh, then we're gonna have two uh, algorithms or groups of algorithms again that will focus on uncertainty quantification. The first one will just look at the actual LLM output and the predicted probabilities. And we're gonna use some kind of very simple algorithms there to quantify the uncertainty of the LLM itself. And then we're gonna use it as a proxy for whether the LLM is hallucinating or not. And then the last option is we're gonna try to uh, encode some kind of semantic meaning in our uncertainty quantification algorithm, and then we're gonna use that to detect hallucinations. And then we're gonna have a very brief experiment results. I'm not gonna go too much in depth there, uh, but we'll see which of these methods tends to perform better uh, and whether they are actually useful in the real world. So let's get started with LM monitoring. So we're gonna talk about what it actually is. And there's basically three pillars to LM monitoring. The first one is just monitoring the infrastructure. This is something that's mostly already handled. If you use an LLM that's not open source, it's if you're using something that's, uh, for example, hosted by OpenAI, uh, then it's already taken care of you, for you. If you're uh, deploying your own LLM, then probably your DevOps team is already handling that. So things like uptime latency, making sure that the LLM is actually online and provides answers. Uh, then we have usage monitoring, so we're gonna monitor everything that has to do with whether the LLM is actually used, whether it's actually used properly, and whether the, um, it's used according to its intended needs. So whether, uh, for example, there was an example where a use case where Chevrolet uh, deployed an LLM to do customer service, and it was mostly used by high school students to solve their homework. So we can monitor the topics discussed, we can monitor the sentiment to make sure it's aligned with its purpose. And then we have hallucination monitoring, when we'll really focus on trying to detect incorrect answers, incomplete answers, vague answers, ambiguous answers, etc. And we're gonna be, today, focusing on that part of hallucination monitoring, which is in some ways actually the most important one because it has to do with the model performance and evaluating whether LLM actually brings value and answers the questions that our users have. So in terms of the evaluation scope, uh, we can look at evaluating whether an answer is hallucinating on kind of four different levels of granularity. Uh, we can look at the full answer when when we have a prompt how to detect hallucinations in an LLM, we can just look at the entire answer at once and try to say whether this answer contains hallucinations or not. This is potentially quite useful in a sense that we know whether we can trust the answer or not, but it's not very actionable. If the actual answer is, let's say, three different paragraphs and we only know that, yes, there is a hallucination there, it's not gonna be very actionable, so we're not gonna really solve a problem, we can just diagnose the problem. Then we can focus on a paragraph, and this is something that's mostly a bit more actionable, and it's still quite useful, because if we know that a given paragraph is wrong, then we can ask the LM to rephrase that paragraph, or we can remove that paragraph from the answer, or, or we can have a human double check the quality of that paragraph. And then similarly, we can focus on the sentence when we get a bit more actionability, uh, but we sacrifice a bit of uh, kind of diagnostic ability, 
because just because one sentence is wrong doesn't necessarily mean that the entire answer is incorrect. Uh, so we're having these, uh, a bit of a trade-off here. And then if we go really extreme, we can look at each token and try to say whether each token is correct or not, whatever the definition of token correctness is. Here, we can technically fix every token separately. So that's useful, for example, if we detect for hallucinated facts, like the previous presenter mentioned that there might be certain facts that we want to check, and that can be done on the token level. But in reality here, uh, it might be that a token is very improbable or unlikely, but the actual sentence is still correct uh, because there's multiple different ways to phrase an answer. Uh, so in the reality, in the practice, most of the solutions focus either, either on the paragraph answers or the sentence evaluation because that's a good trade-off between being able to diagnose whether the answer is actually useful and being able to solve the issue. Now, as I already mentioned, there are kind of two big families of algorithms that have been developed in the last, I would say, two years uh, to deal with hallucinations. One will leverage another LLM or potentially the same LLM, uh, and we're gonna query that LLM once or multiple times uh, to kind of ask it whether this answer actually uh, detects hallucinations. And of course, there is the obvious question, uh, what about if that uh, LLM is also hallucinating? So we have this, you know, who watches the watchman issue? Uh, another option is to use the uncertainty quantification techniques that were, you know, have been in development for the last 40, 50 years on the output of LLM. So we're gonna look at the token probabilities in some ways and try to quantify the uncertainty of the answer and use it as a proxy for uh, whether the answer is hallucinated or not. So let's start with the first part, uh, the LLM based, and we're gonna focus on the consistency uh, detection or consistency evaluation of an LLM to detect hallucinations. To give you an example, the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna ask an LLM multiple times uh, the same prompt, and we're gonna vary some kind of variable like the temperature or just random seat. Random seat is a perfect way to vary things uh, to get a different answer. And then we're gonna measure how similar those answers are. If we see here that uh, these answers are very, very similar, um, but there is some variance here. And then we're gonna use some kind of similarity metric between those answers, ideally also taking into account the prompt that we've given, so we're gonna condition on the prompt, and we're gonna evaluate how similar those answers are. And the intuition here is, is that if we ask an LM, you know, in the limit, in theory, the same question a thousand times, and it always gives the same answer, then it means that this knowledge is very strongly embedded in the LM, and the answer is most likely correct because it's been there based on multiple examples. And if we ask an LM question a thousand times and it gives us a thousand different answers that have nothing to do with each other, then it's most likely just inventing things on the spot. There is no deep knowledge about the answer. Uh, so it's very uh, kind of divergent in the way it answers. It's probably hallucinated. That's the general idea. And you can see that humans are a bit the same. If you ask a person something that they know as a fact, that's a very simple fact, they will always give the same answer. But if you ask for something that's hard or they're very uncertain about, they might answer differently depending on the time of day, how they feel, where they are, etc. So we're using that kind of intuition here. Then in terms of the details, what we're gonna do as I already mentioned, we're gonna call them multiple times, measure the consistency of the answer. Uh, of course, Main issue here is that it does require multiple calls to an LLM to actually evaluate the quality, which increases the costs, potentially to levels that are unsustainable for your use case, depending on the value your use case brings versus the risk it brings as well uh, versus the cost of an LLM call. Uh, we don't require access to probabilities, which means that we can work uh, with closed source LLMs that don't disclose token probabilities, such, such as OpenAI uh, LLMs. And generally speaking, uh, what we've seen and also what's reported in the literature, it has good performance. This is a very qualitative statement. I'm gonna get a bit more quantitative later on. Uh, I already mentioned that what we need to do is we need to get different answer and then we need to evaluate how similar they are in some way. Uh, so the first kind of lever or 
uh, knob that we can turn and adjust is how do we get different answers. And there's kind of three ways here that they were all evaluated in the literature. The first one is we can just change the random seed. Uh, so we get the answer that's generally the same up to randomness. And this is something that's mostly has been done uh, when we just ask the LM again and again and again. This is what you get if you ask in chat GPT, regenerate the answer. It just changes random seed uh, and it gives you an answer that's gonna be very similar but not exactly the same. Another thing we could potentially do is adjust the temperature. So basically how creative the LM is or to be a bit more uh, scientific here, uh, whether it chooses the highest probability to tokens all the time or whether it's gonna vary, uh, whether it's gonna choose a lower probability token from time to time. Uh, this is generally not a very good idea because we're getting answers from an LM with a different hyperparameter. So it's not apples to apples comparison. And then we can also use an LM to paraphrase the prompt, which in practice works well, but we're doing yet another LLM call and we're adding yet more risk because maybe the paraphrase, LM that's paraphrasing the prompt is actually hallucinating, so we're not getting the same prompt. So it's just additional unnecessary risk. So generally speaking, we use changing the seed. Uh, and then the second knob that we can turn, the second kind of, again, hyperparameter, is how do we measure the consistency between answers? How do we measure the similarity between answers uh, to the same prompt? One way to do it is just ask an LM again, and again, uh, we have a recurring thing, theme here, it works very well. Um, we can just ask how similar those answers are. Um, please evaluate it on the score with zero and one. And uh, we can just do prompt, a bit of prompt engineering. Maybe there's some rug there. So the, uh, uh, the LM has examples of very similar answers and very dissimilar answers. Uh, another option is to use cosine similarity. Although cosine similarity has been catching a bit of flack recently in terms of whether it's actually a good measure to evaluate uh, the similarity of text. But it's a very simple, very robust measure. Uh, it might be not the most accurate, but it, it definitely works better than nothing. And then we can use a simpler, let's say, small language model such as BERT to evaluate the quality, uh, the similarity between um, different, basically, token vectors. An example of a paper that talks about it, and I think the first paper that implemented that idea is self-check GPT. Uh, I can take a screenshot here, sorry, I'll take a photo, uh, or I can just send you later on as well. And that's the first way to evaluate LLMs. Now we're gonna go to the second one, which is directly asking an LLM to evaluate the quality of the prompt and the answer. Uh, how does it work? An example, we're just gonna get the prompt, the answer, and then we're gonna create additional prompt that's gonna basically forward the prompt and the answer to an evaluation LLM, and we're gonna ask it to evaluate any metric you want, such as correctness, completeness, grammar, consistency, ambiguity, etc. So we're using pure LMs here, there's basically no maths there. Um, and the idea here is that LMs are basically the best tool we have at our disposal currently to evaluate the quality of text answers, so why not use them? And turns out it actually works very, very well. Uh, it has the highest correlation with human evaluations of hallucination detection of any of the methods so far implemented. Um, it requires only a single additional call, but it is a complex additional prompt. So again, cost might be an issue here, but it's definitely cheaper than looking at the consistency of the answer. Uh, but we are relying more on LMs and less on human intuition and maths, uh, which is yet another kind of second order risk factor. We don't require access to probabilities because we're working with text, we don't work with token probabilities, and we can include any metric we want. We're not only focusing here on hallucination detection, but we can check for anything we want as part of the same prompt, so we're getting a bit of free lunch here. Example paper, again here, uh, you can take a photo or I can send it to you later. Uh, and again, we're gonna talk about the knobs that we can turn, the things we can adjust and here there's just one question, apart from of course the prompt engineering that comes into evaluating and asking how would you evaluate the quality of that answer, that's a, a big one. But apart from that, the main question is what LM should be used as an evaluator? And 
there is kind of on a high level just three options. We can use a simple LLM, uh, which is a good idea if cost is a factor and you want to really reduce the cost of your hallucination detection and monitoring. And there, uh, this LLM might not be necessarily the best at evaluating the quality, but it's still gonna correlate with human answers, so we're gonna be able to capture some or ideally most of the hallucinations uh, at cheap cost. We can use the same LLM we're using, uh, which is kind of the most, the easiest answer because we don't need to build any additional pipelines, we don't need to build uh, any additional engineering around it, we just query uh, the same LLM with a slightly different prompt for every query that user makes. And additionally, if we use an LLM that's not best on the market, we could think about using a better LLM for evaluating, but generally speaking, the better LLMs, they don't hallucinate as much, so if hallucination reduction is our main goal, then we should already use the best LLM available to actually get the answers and get the prompts. Uh, there's almost never a reason to evaluate the quality of an LLM with an LLM that's better than the one that you're actually using. Yeah, that is, I think, it when it comes to the LLM-based architecture or LLM-based uh, algorithm groups or algorithm types. Now we're gonna look at a bit more mathy examples uh, and we're gonna delve deeper, as LM say, into the uncertainty-based LM hallucination detection algorithms. First, let's focus on kind of the simplest benchmark algorithm in a sense, uh, which is output uncertainty quantification, where we're gonna look at the output of an LM and try to see uh, whether we can deduce something from the token probabilities uh, that we see here uh, whether the LM is hallucinating. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the prompt, we're gonna get the answer, but on top of the answer, we're also gonna get the actual token probabilities. So here we need to have access to complete uh, answer from the LM, not just the text, and we're gonna need to have access to the actual token probabilities for each of the tokens that was chosen as part of the answer. And then we're gonna use these uh, probabilities in some way, we're gonna run some algorithm on those to get the confidence score saying how confident we are or how confident actually the LM is in its answer. And then one minus that can be used as a kind of hallucination score. If the algorithm is very uncertain of its answer, then uh, we can assume it's hallucinating. So it gives us one number that's very easy to interpret and it's quite easy to reason about. This is basically how uncertainty quantification has been working in computer vision, in earlier deep learning, in traditional ML. This is the way to try to quantify the uncertainty of the algorithm by just looking at the probability of each of the answer it gives. Um, again, pros and cons. Good thing here is that uh, we don't require additional LLM calls. It is by far the cheapest option. Uh, and it gives okay performance, it still shows slight positive correlation with human answers, so we are able to capture some of the hallucinations, but it is far from perfect, so I wouldn't use it uh, for actual high stakes LLM use cases, but if you have some internal use case, maybe augmented with RAC as well, then uh, it might be good enough. Uh, but bad thing is that we do require access to chosen token probabilities, which means uh, that we cannot use that with open AI LLMs. Um, now we talk, now kind of see the structure here. We're gonna talk about the levers that we can pull, the things we can adjust in the algorithm. And the main question we should ask is, how can we use these numbers to actually quantify the uncertainty of the algorithm? You have these numbers here. We can look at them all together in some way. We can just find the maximum, right? Uh, we can just take the mean. These are the easiest things, and these are the things that actually most papers focus on evaluating. You could potentially treat it as some kind of time series and try to predict whether the hallucination happens if you have uh, good ground truth. So you could do quite a lot of stuff with sequence analysis when you just treat the probability as a sequence because the LMs are autoregressive algorithms, so you can just look at it as it outputs a sequence of probabilities. What is the probability that the entire sequence is correct? And the simplest way to answer that question is to look at the mean or average token probability. Uh, this in practice doesn't work very well because here, if you look at this answer, it's 
you can use LLM, correct answer. Alternatively, you can measure uncertainty of the output, also correct answer. Finally, you can build a random forest, completely hallucinated answer that doesn't make any sense, and yet the average token probability is quite high because the algorithm is quite sure of everything except literally this one word here. So more reasonable option that works a bit better in uh, real world scenarios is looking at the minimum token probability where we're just looking at places where the algorithm kind of breaks and doesn't know what to say so it hallucinates that part. And everything from that part on is likely to be hallucinated. Of course, this is something that can be improved and it's already been worked on. Uh, just wanna give the kind of high level overview of how uncertain quantification can work. Uh, that's really it. Now, looking at semantic uncertainty quantification, this is probably the hardest algorithm to explain. Uh, so, I'm gonna do my best here, but no promises. So, what we're gonna do here is instead of looking just at the chosen token probabilities, we'll want to see all the outputs of an algorithm that are semantically equivalent. So, if we ask, what is the capital of France? Uh, the algorithm can answer Paris, or it can answer the capital of France is Paris, or Paris is the capital of France. To you as humans, these are exact same answers, they are all correct, they are not hallucinated. However, if we look at just token probabilities, and we see that Paris, or D, or capital, are equally probable, because the algorithm is unsure how to phrase the answer, we would get low token probability, and we would conclude that the answer is hallucinated. Uh, so we really want to focus on the meaning of the answer and not just the um, semantics of it, how it's structured. And to do that, we'll have to traverse this kind of very fast expanding graph, I think it's exponential, of possible answers, possible first tokens, possible second tokens after given the first token, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we're gonna sum up all the probability of all answers that are semantically equivalent. And this is gonna be our, um, semantic probability that the answer is correct. To give you an example here, again, uh, we want to focus on looking at these two answers. Let's say that these two answers give D and Paris, give token probability of 0 0.49. So very likely. Uh, if we look at our previous approach, when we just look at the token probability that has been chosen, this looks like a hallucination. We have low token probability of saying Paris which is obviously not the case. The answer the algorithm is very correct that the capital of France is Paris, but it's uncertain of how to phrase it. Uh, and kind of on the opposite side of the spectrum, we see that this answer is phrased almost the same as this answer, but obviously this answer is a hallucination, this answer is correct. So we want to have some semantic way to distinguish that answer from this answer and make this answer semantically equivalent to that answer. So we need to measure that. Uh, how do we do it? With another LLM that's gonna tell us whether it's correct or not, or with uh, some simpler language model like BERT. So again, we're coming back to relying on um, the LLMs, and which might be kind of an intuition why the LLM-based models actually work so well, because they implicitly already do that kind of thing when they look at the actual language answer, the text answer, and not just the probabilities. Pros and cons requires access to all token probabilities, and this really cannot be overstated, so we have to look at all possible, or maybe not in reality, all possible generations, but we'll have to regenerate the answer multiple times or look at multiple possible ways that the answer can be generated, and then take all the token probabilities and analyze them. Uh, so it is rather expensive to run, but if we run in a maybe high security environment where calling external LMs is not, uh, is out of the question, then it's a good thing we don't require additional LLM calls. And this is really the nicest thing from kind of <coughs> beauty perspective is that we do incorporate the full semantic meaning of words, sentences, paragraphs. We can really evaluate uh, the quality of the answer and not just the way it's phrased. Uh, so it has good performance. Um, again, there is a very interesting paper, but I don't expect this kind of approach to work anytime soon, just because it's quite uh, expensive to run. Um, 
There's another thing that I want to uh, touch upon here, which is when to stop. Technically, we'd like to traverse the entire graph, but that's just way too much. So what we want to do as a heuristic is we want to capture 90% of total probability mass. So we want to get uh, all the answers in our tree, and we're going to analyze the, our tree for semantic equivalence that contains 90% uh, probability of all the answers that could be generated. So we want to focus on the most likely answers that the LLM can give, because if there is some semantically equivalent answer that the algorithm has, you know, one in a million chance of generating, it's not gonna change our evaluation much, so we can safely ignore that. And we want to only focus on the most likely answers because they will change our metric. Um, yeah, and as I already mentioned, I already did that slide. What is semantic equivalent? We can ask an LLM, we can look at the cosine distance in the embedding space, so if we uh, embed our um, prompt and answer, ideally answer conditioned on prompt, uh, then we can look at cosine distance uh, between the answers and see whether they are semantically equivalent. So that is it when it comes to the actual algorithm description. Now let's take a brief look at the actual experiment results. So what you see here is we look at four different metrics, correctness, relevance, informatives, and the average of those three. Uh, and what we have here is we have human evaluators. Each point is a prompt and answer pair. Uh, and LLM correctness is basically how uh, LLM evaluation scores, so the second algorithm we described today, um, actually evaluates. So we see that there is generally strong correlation. I was quite surprised, but in literature, uh, the metric to evaluate the quality of LLM evaluation and hallucination is just correlation with human evaluators. Because there is no true ground truth and human evaluators actually disagree from time to time. So we see that um, the correlation of LLM evaluation algorithm is quite high for correctness, which is I think the most important metric for the average score, whether it's informative and whether it's relevant. Kind of on the opposite side, of the spectrum, uh, we have sentence level probabilities. So we're looking at minimum level, minimum probability uh, of a given sentence, and we're evaluating that. So we're looking at this simple uncertainty quantification on the sentence level, not on the paragraph level. And we see here that the correlation is much lower with uh, the human evaluator, so with the ground truth. Uh, but it's still quite positive. Uh, especially if you look at the average and the correctness. When it comes to informativeness, it really doesn't correlate, but model uncertainty is not supposed to tell us anything about informativeness. It's supposed to tell us about whether the, model, the answer is correct, and we see here that the correlation is still okay. And now last, probably the most interesting finding is if we try to see what's the correlation between uh, here, the average probabilities per sentence, and the LLM evaluation, so we're not looking at ground truth here, they are basically not correlated. So there's definitely some kind of way that we could try to do some kind of ensembling and look at LLM evaluation plus uncertainty quantification and then build a model that actually takes hallucination based on both these signals. And then hopefully we get a better way to detect hallucinations, but that is still a very early stage work. Uh, so now, just a summary. Hallucinations can already be reliably detected and reduced with current technology. It's not perfect, it's far from perfect, but we can deal with them somewhat. And two efficient solutions, given some constraints, are using answer evaluation with LM directly. It's good, but it's moderately expensive, and uh, we don't need to have probabilities, which is great if we will use OpenAI or any of the closed source LMs. And another option is simple uncertainty quantification. It's a great benchmark algorithm. First thing really to implement if you have LMs in production. Uh, it's cheap, it's simple, it gives okay performance. So yeah, thanks for listening. That is it. And thank you very much. Uh, do we still have time for Q&A? Looking at the organizers, I think so. Let's assume so. If they stop us, they stop us. Questions? Yeah, uh, do you need a mic?
Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, so here, basically, for hallucination, we rely on human evaluation. For evaluating the algorithms that evaluate hallucinations, uh, what we do and what's done in literature is that there is multiple data sets, there is WikiQA and few others that just ask human evaluators whether this answer is correct based on the entry in Wikipedia. Uh, so if the, the LM is for some reason really stuck on bad answer, uh, then it's still hallucinating, but it's probably hallucinating because it's been trained on bad data, poison data, incomplete data, etc. If you, you know, train data on fortune, then you probably shouldn't expect very high level of factual correctness. Go ahead. Sorry, I think here we'll need a microphone. Go ahead. Yes, we, some technique basically look at whether the LLM uh, is confident in their answer or not. So what if the LLM is confidently wrong? Yeah, so in that case, the uh, LLM will fail. Uh, that's basically the idea. And the algorithm will fail. Uh, here we're hoping and we're based, basing the algorithm on the fact that alg the LLMs generally know what they don't know about. There's also a very interesting paper that basically proves that for vast majority of the answers, LLMs can actually correctly evaluate their own uncertainty and whether they know the answer or not. And even right now you have, I think again, previous presentation, sometimes the LM will tell you it doesn't know if it works with rack, if it works with some kind of guardrails. Uh, so it's quite reliable, but of course there's edge cases when it will break. Hallucination detection, just like you know, any machine learning, is about being right on the average, being able to capture 90, 95, maybe 99% of hallucinations, maybe 40, uh, but it will not get to 100 because we're dealing with Noisy systems. Yeah. Microphone. Yeah. Okay. So just to add on the hallucination thing. So if the all the model keeps agreeing on the wrong thing, it's not really hallucination. It's just maybe wrong data. So that that's the first thing. The second thing I want to talk about is. Um, the use of uh, semantic meaning, uh, cosine similarity. Uh -huh. So cosine similarity is a dot product that is normalized. And there is this research paper that says that sometimes it's fast due to the fact that it's not about the function, it's more about the vocab that you use. So would you, do you have another solution or do you think the use of just the dot product would be enough in this case? Yeah, so thanks for the questions. I think the first question is kind of yet another iteration on the first two questions. When if the LM is confidently incorrect, it's still incorrect, but the uncertainty-based algorithms for detecting hallucinations will fail there. Um, we would still consider that the hallucination from the business perspective. From the technical perspective, it's been trained on the wrong data and it's still an issue. So it's just about the root cause analysis when we look at if the algorithm is consistently giving the same incorrect answer, uh, then we know that just fixing anything kind of post-inference will not fix the problem. We need to adjust the algorithm, we need to fine tune it, remove the data from the training, in worst cases, retrain the LLM. Uh, and as for uh, your second question, indeed, cosine similarity is not the best way to evaluate similarity. Uh, and here we have uh, basically using a lamp to evaluate similarity between the models as our kind of second idea that will work better, uh, but then we're leaving more and more of our evaluation to an LLM, uh, which carries risks because, you know, who watches the watchman It's gonna be better than cosine similarity, but at least we understand the failure modes of cosine similarity. We don't necessarily understand the failure modes of uh, an LLM that's used for evaluation. So I guess this, this might be a whole new talk, but so there's hallucination prevention. So do you have any pointers on that? So just don't ask it the question that would force it to start hallucinating. Is there any work on that that you can pointers to? 
Yeah, so that's an excellent question, and I think it comes after hallucination detection. Uh, right now, the way we're looking at it, and as we're building our tool, the way we look at it is hallucination detection is the first step, and then uh, what you can do is detect hallucinations within your application, and before the answer gets sent to the end user, if you detect hallucination, then you can take steps to mitigate it. So you can uh, ask the LM, this answer is incorrect, answer correctly, or you can just output, this answer has been flagged as likely incorrect to the user. So you can either add some metadata that this answer is likely incorrect, you can just output hard-coded answer, I don't know, uh, or you can ask an LLM again and again and again, again until the hallucination detection algorithm says it's okay. So these are kind of free mitigation strategies. Hard code say, I don't know if hallucination is detected. Flag the relevant centers or paragraph that's hallucinated or ask an LLM again to evaluate, um, to answer again the same prompt with the additional sub prompt that your previous answer was incorrect. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I'm Matai, CEO of Copilot Kit. Uh, so my question is, um, is there a you know, best in class benchmark for, okay, let's say cost was not a concern. Uh, how well can we do, you can query the best LLM a thousand times, take the most popular answer, whatever uh, you do that, you know, how far can we get to removing hallucinations with current technology, even in the best case? Yeah, thanks for the question, that's a very good question. Almost died here. Uh, so, this is, the answer is unfortunately it depends, and it depends on multiple factors. One is the LLM in question, uh, the second one is the algorithm, generally speaking, using an LLM to evaluate the quality of an LLM is the best algorithm we have right now. So, on the evaluator LLM as well. Then, and I think this is really the most important part, is the use case. So, if you, ask about something that's easy to evaluate, uh, then we're gonna be able to catch more hallucinations and something that's more in kind of mainstream knowledge that LMs have been exposed to over and over again. Then the LMs will also be able to evaluate its own uncertainty better. Uh, if we uh, look at something that the LMs have not been exposed to much, like um, synthesizing new chemical compounds in uh, low gravity environments, for example, and they will probably just answer bullshit all the time, and they will also not know whether they are correct or not. Uh, and kind of the third, um, it depends part, is um, whether we have RAG, whether we have additional sources of knowledge that the LLM can use, because if LLM can use that source of knowledge, then the LLM that's using to evaluate the hallucination can also use that source of knowledge. And then there is last part is right now we see this kind of reinvention of the wheel. Uh, when we look at the machine learning, uh, you know, typical machine learning evaluation when you have a test set. Now this is called in uh, LMs a golden set because we like reinventing new terminology, I guess, but it's exactly the same thing. So if you have this and you can keep on collecting and extending this golden data set as your uh, algorithm is in production as your LM is in production, then you'll be able to evaluate better. Hope that answers your question. Right? I think that is it. So thank you again and hope you like it.